Hi friends, would you like to hear an amazing fact? The human brain is the most powerful computer in the world. It's got about a hundred billion neurons that are processing a quadrillion synapses that make it much more powerful than the most powerful supercomputer that's in Japan right now. In fact, the most powerful man-made computer, a room full of supercomputers, can only produce about 0.3% of the processing power of a human brain in one second. I understand if they were going to make a computer that could do all that the human brain does, it would take a building as big as the Empire State Building to hold it, it would take all of the power of Niagara Falls to power it, and all of the water of Niagara Falls to cool it, Matter of fact, the most powerful supercomputer in the world is only half as smart as a mouse's brain. You know, the Bible has a lot to say about what you can do to make your brain even clearer. Welcome to this presentation of Revelation Now. <laughs> Good evening, friends. We'd like to welcome you all back to Revelation Now. This is a live interactive Bible study looking at some of the most important prophecies and truths found in Scripture. So we'd like to welcome all of those joining us, not only in North America, but across the world. And we're glad you're tuning in. This has been quite uh, an experience looking at these very important prophecies. Tonight, a very important subject entitled Babylon's Buffet, and we'll be getting to that in just a few moments. We'd like to remind you that we are translating this live into Spanish, and if you'd like to get the Spanish translation, you can do so at the Amazing Facts Latino Facebook and YouTube channels. We'd also like to remind you we are sign language available for the deaf, and that is available at the Revelation Now website. And then we'd also like to greet our uh, friends who are watching in different languages that this program is being translated into. We've gotten word back that it's been translated into Serbian, so we'd like to greet those who are watching in Serbian, Italian, Spanish of course, Thai, as well as Vietnamese. So we'd like to greet all of those who are watching on the various uh, outlets in the different languages. I'd like to remind you that following the program, we're going to be taking your Bible questions. And if you have a Bible question, you can type it in the comment section on Facebook, on the Amazing Facts Facebook page. And we'll try to answer as many of those questions as we can. We also want to thank you for the great testimonies that you've been sending in. And we have just a few I'd like to highlight this evening. We have Redum from Norway. He says, I'm so blessed by your programs. You explain the Bible in a very clear and understandable way. If you'd like to greet those in Norway, we have Gemma from the Philippines. Thank you for these programs. They make me want to start reading the Bible again. Amen. That's what we hope as a result of these programs. Davion from uh, Jamaica. I'm blessed to tune in. I'm learning so much. I can't wait for the next program. Thank you. And then we have Lanny and Kim from Ventura, California, not too far from where we are here in Northern California. They have a little group that's meeting in their home, and they've been watching all of the programs. They say, we are so excited to share these truths of the Bible and also have the resources to reach those who are seeking for Bible truth. So we'd like to greet all of those watching in Ventura, California, as well as the other sites around the country. Tonight, as mentioned, our topic is Babylon's Buffet. We do have a lesson that goes along with the presentation. It's called Babylon's Buffet, same title, and you can download this lesson. It's at the Revelation Now website. And we want to encourage you to take time to read through the lesson, look up the different Bible verses. You can fill in the answers. It'll help reinforce the truths that you are studying. Our free gift, our free offer is a magazine, one of our more popular magazines here at Amazing Facts. It's called Amazing Health Facts, Eight Bible Secrets for a Longer and Stronger Life. And we would like to make this available to anyone who would like to receive it. All you'll have to do is just text the code HEALTHFUL or the word HEALTHFUL to the number 40544 and you'll be able to get a digital copy of the magazine, Amazing Health Facts. Or if you're outside of North America, we don't want to forget about you. It is available for download at the Revelation Now website, revelationnow.com. Click on the resource and you'll be able to download this great magazine, Amazing Health Facts. Well, with that, we'd like to invite Pastor Doug to come forward 
and we will prepare for our presentation tonight. Pastor Doug, this is one of my favorite presentations. It's very practical and uh, helpful, and I think folks will be blessed. Yep, we're going to be talking about how they can uh, postpone their funeral. That's so I think thing. everybody's <laughs> going to be amazed what the Bible says about yeah, that. Absolutely. Well, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, again, we thank you that we just open up your word and study. Not only do you share with us things that are yet to happen in the future, but you also provide practical truths and information for our day-to-day -day living. So thank you for this time. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Ross. And Again, I want to remind everybody that immediately following the presentation, Pastor Ross will come back. We're going to sit down. We're going to answer questions you might have on this subject or previous presentations. So we'd encourage you to stay tuned for that. You know, uh, the study tonight is one of my favorites, and we're going to be talking about health. And you might be thinking, oh, you did a bait and switch on us, Pastor Doug. You said we we're going to be talking about Revelation, and you're talking about health. Well, the book of Revelation actually says something about that. It does talk about restoring us to the tree of life. You know, the first three chapters in the Bible tell how man lost access to the tree of life through sin because they ate the wrong thing and they were evicted from the garden. All the sin and misery have come into the world. The last three chapters in the Bible, in Revelation, talk about being restored to that tree once again and man once again enjoying eternal life. And, but there's some practical things we can do now to have a more abundant life, and the Bible talks about this. Now, one of the Bible prophecy books we've been looking at is the book of Daniel. It's interesting how this Bible prophecy book of Daniel begins talking about a battle between what to eat and what not to eat. If you look in the first chapter of Daniel, this is where you're going to find this. It's our story for tonight. Nebuchadnezzar the king ultimately came and he destroyed Babylon. He, or he destroyed Jerusalem. He burnt the city and destroyed it. Shortly before he did that, he carried a number of captives off to Babylon. And he picked some of the choice young men that were uh, actually descendants from King David and Hezekiah. And he wanted to have some young men he could train in the Babylonian court. Uh, always wanted to take the, the brightest and the best from some of the kingdoms that he was subjugating and train them in their language and their arts and their sciences so that they could uh, be part of his cabinet and his wise men, his counselors, and he always wanted the best of the best. Well, among the four that were chosen was Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. But there's a little problem. They were supposed to be introduced into this Babylonian university, and the king said, at my expense, I'm going to take care of you. I'll give you some decent lodgings. You're going to be much better off than the other captives that are little more than slaves. And I'm going to feed you the best Babylonian food. But there was a problem there. That Babylonian food contained things that uh, God had forbidden his people to eat. You can read in Daniel 1.8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat. You know, the Bible says your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and whosoever defiles that temple, him will God destroy. And that's in the New Testament. Daniel made up his mind not to defile his body with those unclean articles or with the fermented wine of Babylon. And, well, the, the master of the eunuchs that was in charge of Daniel and his uh, three friends, he was worried. He said, look, my obligation is to keep you guys taken care of, well-fed, so that you can get through school and perform well. He said, if you start looking anemic, it's going to be my head. I can't have you not eating the best food. Daniel said, tell you what, let's make a deal. You give us 10 days. Prove us. Prove your servants for 10 days. Daniel 1, 12, I beseech thee. And let them give us pulse to eat. That's just, you know, like vegetable stew. Pulse to eat and water to drink. And then you consider what we look like after that period of time. He said, well, fair enough. And so after 10 days of Daniel and his three friends eating, basically a vegetarian diet, drinking water, the Bible records at the end of 10 days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat from the portion of the king's meat. See, that Babylonian food include things, included things that the Bible said were forbidden and unclean. And uh, Daniel and his friends they thought this is so important to God that they were willing to uh, put their lives on the line and say, we're not going to defile ourselves 
with the unclean food of Babylon. You know, the end of this chapter tells us that uh, Daniel and his friends were in, uh, investigated. They were examined by the king and his counselors, and they found them ten times wiser than all of the wise men in the king's cabinet. Not only that, in the last verses it says, Daniel continued unto the time of King Cyrus. Daniel lived to roughly a hundred years of age. The very first chapter in this book of prophecy is telling us there was a connection between the body and the spirit. And making up your mind to take care of your body does have an impact on your spirit. See, it's very simple. We are a combination of spirit, God speaks to us through our minds, and flesh. And uh, they are interacting in your brain. And if you take care of your body, it'll help improve your mind and your brain. You think better. You can respond better to the Holy Spirit. You hear the voice of God better. The devil wants us to destroy our minds and our bodies. Well, the devil is out to destroy us any way he can. In God's word, he gives, gives us guidelines so that we can have healthy, longer, stronger lives. And we're going to talk about that but before we get to our questions in our lesson, I always like to go out and talk to the people on the street, ask them what they think about some of these issues of the Bible and health. Eating the right foods, you know, exercising, stuff like that, you know, it, it proves to show that with that, you'll, you'll be able to uh, live a happier and a longer life. Uh, I think having like a healthy lifestyle and healthy, you know, exercise routine or diet will help you have for longer life. I feel like there are studies that show there are, but I mean, I think you should just eat whatever you want. I don't know. I do believe that you can prolong your life with a healthy diet, um, work on it every day, vegetables, plant-based. Whole food is better for you than processed food, and so I try to do that. Bottom feeders. Uh, we're not supposed to eat that. Uh, we're not supposed to eat pigs. I do believe there is. It is like a sin to be intoxicated in specific ways, so I believe so, yes. Definitely not too fatty foods. I, I'm not aware of any food or beverage that we should not be uh, consuming based on something in the Bible. You want to make sure that you not only respect what you put into your body, as far as like the intake of not only food, but the bad temptations in life, but also you want to make sure that you, you treat your body with love, kindness, and that's what you'll receive out of it. Those who are born again, who have received Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, um, the Holy Spirit resides in them. And so he no longer resides, God no longer lives in a temple built by man, but in, in, in dwells people. Okay, there you have it, friends. Have some interesting insights from people on what the Bible says about the importance of health, and the Holy Spirit indwelling us, our bodies being the temple of the Holy Spirit. But we're going to go and find out what the Word of God has to say on this. Now, the title of the lesson you may find a little intriguing, Babylon's Buffet. In the book of Revelation, you find the word eat seven times. And it talks about eating the wrong thing. It talks about do not eat those things sacrificed to idols. That would be Babylon's Buffet. And then Jesus said, I'll give you to eat of the hidden manna, the bread of life. So you've got the, the food, the spiritual food and the physical food of God and the world. And so we're going to look at that and find out that both the body and the flesh are influenced by these decisions. First question, we're going to go to the Word of God here. What was the original diet that God designed for humans? When God first made man, what was the original diet? You can read in Genesis 1.29, and God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed. And it goes on to say, And every tree in which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for food. So the original diet when God made man was a vegetarian diet. Keep in mind, nothing in the Garden of Eden died. The original plan before sin was for everything to live. And so people weren't eating animals. The original diet was fruits, grains, nuts, legumes. But then things began to evolve. It says, after Adam and Eve sinned, our second question, what supplemental food did God add to their diets? And you read, you shall eat the herb of the field. That's what we would call vegetables. Maybe there was some enzyme or something that was in the um, uh, fruit tree of life that now they suddenly did not have anymore. And he said, you need to also eat vegetables. I know there's a lot of young people that wish this verse was not in the Bible. 
And, you know, as I go around, I ask people, and our audience here, I'm sure, is going to know the answer to all this, but uh, what's the difference between a fruit and a vegetable? Apple? Fruit. Um, zucchini? Fruit. Avocado? Fruit. Carrot? Vegetable. Potato? Brussels sprouts? Flour? See, they're inedible. It's all I know. <laughs> so people are surprised that um, anything that is the product of the flour is technically the fruit of it. But uh, that was added to the diet. I'm just throwing in an extra amazing fact here. I read in 2015 how Jeanette and Alan Murray, actually it's 2013, they entered the uh, Guinness World Records. They ran 10,000 miles all the way around Australia. They actually ran a marathon every day for 365 days, and they added one extra marathon on January 1st. But not only did they run around Australia, they ran around Tasmania. And Jeanette had uh, Rashid recovered from cancer, and she believed that it was due to her adopting a vegetarian and a vegan diet. And they ran all this way eating a vegetarian diet, and they're, of course, committed vegetarians and vegans. Uh, and when they did it, she was 64, and Alan was 68. Yeah, it does make a difference in longer, stronger life and also helping to ward off certain diseases. Is God concerned with our physical health? People think the Bible is just a spiritual book and it doesn't have any practical information on how you feel physically. Not so. Matthew chapter 4, 23, And Jesus went about all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and disease among the people. The Lord wants us to be healthy. His original plan was for people to live forever. The devil is the one who brought in disease and sickness, and all of that came because of sin. And there are some basic Bible principles that God gives us in his word, and if we follow these things, we've got a lot better chance of living a longer life. Frankly, uh, I would like to go out like Moses did. Um, Moses, he lived to 120. God said, Moses, it's time for you to die. He climbed the mountain. The Bible says his eye was not dimmed, nor was his natural force abated, and he died. That's the way to do it. Just be active to the end. But because of the living habits of most people in the Western world, a lot of folks spend the last 30 years of their life dying. Because, and that's one reason that our health system is nearly bankrupt is because of the lifestyles of the average person and the people are being uh, fed the wrong information which results in the eating the wrong kind of food and they're suffering the results of that. Beloved, Jesus said, I wish above all things, this is 3 John 1, 2, that you might prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. And don't forget this. God is interested in your soul prosperity but he's in interested in your physical prosperity. If that was not true, why would he want to give us new bodies when we get to heaven? He does care how we feel. And you know, the, the reason for a Christian to do anything is because you love God and you love your fellow man. When you feel better, when you're healthy, you're better able to serve God and to serve your fellow man. So because you love God, because you love your neighbor, and because you love yourself, you need to take care of your bodies. This is part of God's plan. I'm very passionate about this subject because uh, I, I grew up eating the Babylon buffet, quite literally. Uh, you know, the Babylonians, they did not follow the same health rules as the Jews, and they ate all kinds of creepy, crawly things. And it's interesting that uh, sometimes people that think the, the rich food is going to be the better food, in reality, there are bigger hospitals in rich countries because they have more disease than some of the poor countries. Um, growing up, we ate snails, turtle, frog legs. I've eaten squirrel, rattlesnake, all kinds of creepy things. And, and I don't think I was ever healthy until I got to be about 17 years of age. We'd wake up in the morning, and uh, my brother and I, growing up in New York City, we'd kind of get ourselves breakfast, which could be a, a Twinkie, Fig Newton, uh, and maybe some concentrated orange juice, tea or coffee, even as kids. 
And no wonder I was just bouncing off the walls when I went to school and had problems. And it probably wasn't until I was 17 years old and living in the mountains and I had no refrigeration. You can't carry canned food up there. Well, you can't. It's very heavy. So you bring up dried food. And I was eating a lot of rice and beans and just simple stuff. For the first time in my life, I started feeling really healthy. And, um, and I was 17 years old before I made, started making the connection. Bible tells us, John 10.10, 10, Jesus said, I have come that they might have life and then they might have it more abundantly. I always like throwing in this picture of Banana George. This was a, a famous citizen of Cypress Gardens. He took a water skiing when he was 47, fell in love with it. You can't tell from this picture. He's actually skiing barefoot, and I hope it's obvious he doesn't have dentures because he's holding the rope in his mouth, and he lived to 98. They call him Banana George. He loved yellow, and he ate bananas all the time. But, uh, yeah. You take care of yourself, and you can have a longer, stronger life. And that's what we're talking about. Uh, we're going to give you the keys and the secrets, so keep listening carefully, and we'll show you the Bible connections. Now, God promised the children of Israel, this is question four, that if they would serve and obey him, he would remove all the sickness from them. Additionally, he said, and I will put upon you none of the diseases that were on the Egyptians. Did he keep his promise? You read in Psalm 105, verse 37, he brought them forth, meaning out of Egypt, and there was not one feeble person among their tribes, and there may have been as many as two million of them because it says they had about 600,000 men that could go to war, plus you got the women and children. And so here you've got this nation of two million. Can you imagine a nation of two million and no clinic? Nobody's sick? The doctor just sitting around watching his watch all day long? He's got nothing to do? Wouldn't that be wonderful? So he gave them some health, health principles when they were going through the wilderness, and we follow these, we can experience that kind of health as well. Now, I want to be, be practical. Uh, I remember a doctor telling me years ago, he says, one of the most important things you can do for good health, he said, choose your ancestors very carefully. So it is true that there are certain, because of sin, we've got genetic issues, and some people are going to be more predisposed to certain illnesses than others. But even with your genes, you can postpone uh, what those problems are going to be by taking care of your health. You know, one reason I got so excited about this subject, I remember reading about, I don't know if anyone remembers, Jack LaLanne. In my days as a kid, he was the health guru all across North America. Housewives would watch him every morning. My grandma always had him on. And he was wearing his jumpsuit, and he did what they call jumping jacks. You've heard of that. It comes from Jack LaLanne. And he lived into his 90s. I think when he was 70 years old, he pulled a boat with 70 kids across San Francisco Bay swimming. Uh, and he, I think he did it again at 80, but may have done it down in San Diego at that time. But, and a little guy, he's like five foot three. But the reason he was so healthy and so conscious of it is his father had a heart attack at 45. And Jack Lane was so shaken by that, and he listened to a health lecture like this from someone talking about health and the Bible, and it so transformed him, he ended up uh, turning a whole generation on to the importance of taking care of your bodies and health, and he demonstrated that. He was nice enough to uh, write a little note to me and, and to thank me for these presentations. Why is our health so important to God? 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Romans 12, 1. We are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice to God, holy and acceptable unto him, which is your reasonable service. You see, you belong to God for a couple of reasons. One, he made you. Two, he redeemed you after the planet had been kidnapped. And so when you present yourselves to him and you ask for the indwelling of his spirit, then uh, he wants to live out his life in you. That's what Paul said. It's not I that live, but Christ that lives in me. Well, if your body's going to be a temple for the Holy Spirit, then you don't want anything in there like Daniel and his friends said. We don't want to defile those temples. And, you know, put very simply, friends, the most important part of you is your brain. Uh, the reason God gave you legs is to carry your brain around. And you've got hands to do the bidding of your brain. And you've got food to help make sure that your brain's got proper nourishment. But you are you because of your brain. Uh, you might lose a hand 
or a foot, an arm, or a leg, and you can still be you. I remember hearing the testimony of Johnny Erickson. Many of you have heard years ago, as a 16-year-old, she had a diving accident. She was paralyzed, essentially, from the neck down, and she wanted to commit suicide. She figured her life was over. What could she do? But she still had a very sharp mind, and she found the Lord. It totally transformed her life. She ended up having a very productive life. As of this recording, she's still alive today. She could sing songs. She would draw with a paintbrush in her teeth. She traveled with Billy Graham and gave her testimony and moved many to accept the Lord. And she said she is so much looking forward to the new body in heaven. But at one point she thought, I have no life to live because everything from the neck down seems useless. What good is life? But she had a brain. And that makes all the difference in the world because that's what really makes you you. Not eating, drinking, exercising, taking care of your body will affect your brain. And your brain is the way that God communicates with you. Now, I don't know about you, but even though I'm doing all I can to take care of my body, and I, I think I'm in pretty good shape for a, a grandfather with eight grandchildren, uh, I know I'm getting older. I'm going to do as much as I can to postpone my funeral as be as productive as I can be to the end. And I hope to get a new glorified body when Jesus comes. The Bible says in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we'll be transformed. We'll get glorified bodies like his body. But I don't think God's going to give me a new body if I wreck the old one. Follow me. Um, if, if you came over to my house and you said, Doug, my, my wife and I are taking a quick vacation to uh, Mexico. Could we borrow your car? And your friend, I said, well, I got an extra car. Sure, I'll lend you my car. And so then after... Two weeks, you're gone. You come driving down the road towards my house, and I can hear you coming. I hear this terrible banging noise, and I look, and there's this car kind of bouncing and limping on a flat tire, and the rims, sparks are flying out the back, and smoke's billowing out from under the hood, and one door, door is kind of hanging off, and you pull up into my yard, and the headlight falls out, and uh, it gives a gasp, and steam's coming out of the radiator, and oil spewing down below, and and it's all banged up, looking like you rolled it in a d demolition derby. And you hop out and say, boy, what a trip. We took a little ride down the Baja 1000 race. Uh, uh, and I hope you don't mind. And we'd like to go again next year. Can we borrow your car? <laughs> I'm not going to lend you my car. Look what you did to it. And if you're wanting God to give you a new body, then show that you care by taking care of the one that he did give you. Life is a gift. You didn't make yourself. You belong to God. And by the way, you know, when you do buy a car, if you buy a new car, somewhere in the glove box, you usually find an owner's manual. And the owner's manual is written by the manufacturer who probably knows that car better than anybody. And I've had pretty luck, pretty good luck in the last few years with cars because I have the regular service done according to the manual. I take care of them. Uh, I drive them until they got maybe 130,000 miles and I usually don't have any problems. Then I start wanting to avoid the big expenses. But I know the manufacturer really knows what they need. Who is the manufacturer? He tells us in his word that the ideal diet for man is a vegetarian diet. Of course, that's including the vegetables. And um, I've been doing that now for many years, and I feel pretty good. I would never go back. Take care of your body. Now, the Bible doesn't say you have to be a vegetarian. I'm just, this is my personal um, testimony on that. What is a good Bible rule for healthful living? Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Now, if it's possible for you to eat and drink to God's glory, then does it stand to reason it would be possible to not eat and drink to God's glory? And there's a lot of people that are not eating and drinking to God's glory, and they're suffering for it. Breaks my heart. I sometimes just I go to the market to get uh, some item, and you can't help but notice sometimes what people have spilling out of their shopping carts. And you can sometimes look at them and look at their shopping cart and see a connection, if you know what I'm saying. And it just breaks my heart because I, they're not getting the connection or they're not being told what the connection is and how much misery and expense and how much it's detracting from their life they're experiencing. All right, let's look at some of these things. How can you not drink to God's glory? What's that? Oh, I got to read the question. Karen said, thank you. Now, question number seven. Should Christians use alcoholic beverages? All right, so we're talking about eating and drinking to God's glory. 
Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, whoever is deceived thereby is not wise. And again, alcohol is addictive. It destroys the brain cells. It dramatically affects our ability to reason. That's not a verse. That's just a fact of science. You know that, um, and this is something that I feel very strongly about because of the facts. I meet Christians every now and then. They'll say, well, didn't Jesus turn the water into wine? So it's okay for Christians to drink wine. Jesus turned the water into grape juice. Jesus would not make a lot of booze to keep a party going. And you look at the amount of water that was in those... Um, containers, those vessels that he filled, and he wouldn't do that. They said, well, you've saved the best for last. This is John chapter 2. They could get alcoholic wine all year long. They couldn't get fresh grape juice except during the harvest. Somehow, he had produced this beautiful fresh grape juice, a symbol of his own blood that he was going to give to the world. And uh, Jesus would never endorse people getting drunk. You look in the Bible, Noah drank wine, and he walked around naked, and family members were cursed as a result. Lot's daughters got their father drunk and he committed incest. David tried to get Uriah drunk so he would go against his conscience and it's still true today. A lot of people have done things under the influence they never would have done otherwise. Over half the people who were in prison committed crimes while under the influence of alcohol. Over half of the people who go to an emergency room are there because of accidents or injury or fighting connected with alcohol. Over half of all the police calls for domestic abuse, alcohol is involved. Now, with facts like that in our society, how much should a Christian support that? You might say, well, you know, as long as I do it in moderation, one out of seven people that drinks becomes a problem drinker or an alcoholic. If you had a dog that bit one out of seven people that came to your house, would you keep it? No, friends, and you know what? It's, it's by your witness. You can destroy other people's lives. Um, I knew a friend that um, he was an alcoholic, but he got the victory over alcohol. And, but one day after church, he was invited home to the pastor's house, not the pastor of our church. And uh, he was shocked when they poured some wine at the table and he began to shake and look very uncomfortable. And the pastor said, are you okay? He said, well, not really. He said, you know, I'm an alcoholic and I've been clean and sober for eight months now. And I never expected to see it here. And the Bible says, don't do anything that might make your brother or sister stumble. And since you don't need it, and since it is an addictive drug, and since there's so many other options, why would you ever want to even tamper with it, even a little bit? I don't think Christians ought to drink any alcohol. And again, the Bible says that um, wine is a mocker. Whoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Christians should not drink alcohol. What will God do to those who defile their body temples? You can read in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. You are the temple of God. If any man defiles the temple of God, him will God destroy. Now that's why Daniel took a pretty strong position. He said, no, our bodies are the temple of God. Their parents had taught them right. They were not going to defile their body temples because you know, defiling the temple, that's what the Antichrist does in Revelation. And you can read about that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And the abomination of desolation will defile the sanctuary. Your body is a sanctuary. And the Bible tells us in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill. And that would mean you also do not kill yourself. Which would mean that if you are taking something into your body and it says on every pack, warning, this is going to kill you, it's kind of like slow suicide. And one of the most easily, I think the second most easily avoidable illness in the world is tobacco. And uh, tobacco is the second most costly drug addiction in North America. And there's so many health problems that are connected with smoking. Um, you know, there's not even any nutritional value. I, I, I always try to imagine in my mind what was happening when Sir Walter Raleigh came back to Europe and he was telling them about the things he had found in the New World. And he said, and look, you'll really like this. And he spreads out all these leaves. And they say, wow, what is it? Tobacco is what the Indians call it. What do you do with it? Well, watch this. And he rolls it up, sets it on the fire, and inhales it. He said, well, why are you doing that? Inhaling smoke makes you dizzy. He didn't tell them that, yeah, it will 
put tar in your lungs and it will become addictive and it's going to kill more people than probably anything. It was fashionable for a while. They could only get it occasionally. People used to smoke once a day, but now it's just spread uh, around the world and it's one of the most deadly addictive habits that there is out there. Now, I'm speaking from someone with experience. I smoked for several years. My grandparents, my mother, my father, they all smoked. And I saw firsthand the results of that. My father ultimately died from lung cancer. It, it, there's nothing good in it. Now, and I know it's a struggle to quit. Believe me, I know. And I would just appeal to anyone out there. If I can do it, my father quit smoking after 50 years, and he, he did live longer. My grandfather smoked for 50 years. He quit. You know what happened? He went to the hospital. He was in the hospital for some uh, abdominal issue. And he had to share his room with another man. And he looked in the bed next to him and he saw this man light a cigarette and put it up to his throat and smoke it through the hole in his throat because he had had his voice box removed because of cancer. My grandfather said, that did it for me. 50 years old, he quit smoking. He lived to 93. Anybody can quit. You can do it. The same way you start, you weren't born smoking. It was a habit you learned. You can unlearn it. It takes a little time, but you'll be so glad. Think of all the money you'll save. It's so expensive. So, yeah, friends. And, you know, if, if you're ever wondering what to do, what would Jesus do? I mean, can you really picture Jesus, uh, you know, a big old wad of chewing tobacco in his cheek, spit running down the edge, or smoke, blowing smoke rings and... It just doesn't look very Christ-like for people to be addicted to anything, especially just to be burning your money up in smoke when you could do so many other good things with it. So I, I don't believe God wants Christians smoking. No, I'm not saying anybody that smoked won't be in heaven. The man who wrote the song Amazing Grace smoked until the day he died. He did not know, John Newton. And, uh, you know, back then they just didn't know. But we know better now. And so we need to get those things behind us. It defiles your temple. What mammals does God permit humans to eat? Now, in the beginning, it wasn't God's plan for Adam and Eve to eat any animals. When God said to Adam, I want you to name the animals, he didn't look at the chicken and say McNuggets and look at the cow and say Whopper, <laughs> Big Mac. Uh, they, you know, they were actually his friends. So originally, God wanted man to eat a vegetarian diet after sin and after the sacrificial system was established, they began to eat small amounts of meat. It was connected with the sacrifice. It was rare. Then after the flood and all the vegetation was destroyed, it became a lot more prominent. Whoever, whatever, whatsoever parts the hoof and is cloven-footed and chews the cud. So among the mammals, it needed a couple of characteristics to be clean for food. It needed to be in the cattle department where it had a cloven hoof and chew the cud, and it needed both categories. But even though you're allowed to eat goat and sheep and deer uh, and uh, cow, it doesn't mean it's healthy for you. Here's a uh, Newsweek article from a few years ago, Mad Cow Disease in the U.S. Another one, the E. coli threat. Can this meat kill you? And we've heard about salmonella poisoning connected with the chickens and the eggs. And, and uh, you're a lot better off. Science, the, the jury is in. Science has demonstrated now that the best thing you can do for your health is avoid animal products. You do not get cholesterol from peanut butter. I couldn't believe it once. I was on the airplane. I saw this little bag of peanuts they gave me. And it said, warning, contains nuts. That I thought was really interesting. But the other thing it said was cholesterol-free. I thought, well, of course it's cholesterol-free. They're peanuts. You don't get cholesterol except through animal products. And now, it not only had to have a cloven hoof, it had to chew the cud. It needed both categories because there are some animals like the swine, the pig, Leviticus 11, verse 7, and the swine, though it divides the hoof, having cloven hooves, yet it does not chew the cud. It is unclean to you. Their flesh you shall not eat, their carcasses you shall not touch. The Bible tells us pigs are an abomination. They are filthy. And uh, I used to have to feed my neighbor's pigs. Was years ago, I had a neighbor ranch. I'd go and I'd milk his cow while he was gone, and I'd feed his pigs. And, and I've, I've had a lot more exposure than I wish I had had. Uh, only thing I can do is to tell you that pigs are pigs. 
Pigs will eat humans, given the opportunity. They'll eat each other. They are scavengers. And now you might have a pet pig, no offense. People also have pet dogs. You know, dogs and pigs are in the same category in the Bible. They might be intelligent, but they're not supposed to be food. They're scavengers. And God does not want us eating the world's garbage cans. You are not supposed to eat a buzzard, the Bible says, you know. Animal dies, God's got things designed in his ecology that you get the buzzard and the birds of carrion and they'll clean things up. Or a pig on the ground. Uh, but uh, we're not supposed to be eating the garbage cans in the environment. When the muscle tissue, and some people get trichina poisoning from pork, when the muscle tissue containing trichina cysts are eaten by human, the cysts are digested in the stomach, they release larvae, migrate to the intestine, and begin a new life cycle. Female trichina worms live about six weeks, and in that time they can release 15,000 larvae. And the migration and insistment of larva can cause fever, pain, even death. And I've heard that on doing autopsies in some communities, one out of five people have been found to have evidence of trichina. And there's so many people that had no idea, and they said, I've got all these problems. I've got bursitis and arthritis, and they didn't know they really had hogitis because they'd been eating pork. Microwaves were a problem because, you know, in a microwave, sometimes it doesn't cook things evenly. And people were microwaving their pork, and it wasn't cooking parts of it. I don't want to eat food where i got to kill all the, the, the worms in it <laughs> before I eat it. People say, yeah, you can eat rabbit in the months that have an R in it. I don't want to eat anything where i got to worry about something like that. This man is bringing home the bacon. He's got, yeah. That was not God's plan. Uh, these are scavengers. I remember as a kid hearing a nursery rhyme. This little piggy went to the market. This little piggy stayed home. This little piggy roast ate roast beef. Even a pig won't eat pork. Look at that. Uh, in Newsweek, September 6, 1999, I saved this clipping. A few years ago, one of the nutritionists said bacon wasn't technically a meat anymore. It didn't belong to any food group at all. It was a salty, nitrate-ridden, fat-laden, carcinogenic thing. And, um, you know, they always adver they advertise pork as the other white meat. It is not a white meat. Pork is, it's full of, uh, it's full of uh, larvae. You realize that when you buy that stuff, it's never been purified from the slaughterhouse to your uh, market where you buy it. Um, I, part of my testimony is that um, I used to have my own meat business. After I lived in the cave, I mentioned I was up there, I felt really good living in the mountains, eating a lot of beans and rice and, and vegetables and things. And uh, then I moved down to the city again. I ended up getting a job. Just It was weird the way it worked out. But I got a job selling steaks. And I would buy, I learned it from the person who trained me. I decided to go into business myself. I'd buy sections of beef. I had freezers in the home. I would butcher them myself. And then I'd sell them. And I used to buy USDA prime beef. And I went to my distributor once. I said, one of my customers is asking for prime pork. And he laughed. He said, you can't get prime pork. I said, what do you mean? You get USDA prime beef? Doesn't they, don't they have prime pork? He said, no. He said, they print leaflets telling you if you're going to cook it, to cook it really well. He said, uh, the Department of Agriculture is terrified of pork because they realize that it's got a really high health risk to it. So I learned this back. And the other thing I learned is... Um, I was eating meat, steak, three times a day. Up in the mountains, I felt great. Came back down to town, I'm eating, I mean, I really was. I was young back then. I could eat almost anything and never got full. <laughs> it seemed like I was always hungry. But I'd have like New York steak and eggs for breakfast. I'd eat a T-bone for lunch. I'd have filet mignon for dinner. It's amazing I'm alive that I was doing that. But I did start feeling bad. I thought, man, how come I'm sluggish? I don't have any energy. I don't feel near as good as I did up in the mountains. And gradually, I started to put two and two together. I learned things I'm sharing in this program. I gave up meat eating 40 years ago, and I'm never going back. I feel so much better now. All right. People say, well, you know, aren't humans designed to eat meat? You know, God gave us these canine teeth, and that's because we're supposed to rip and tear and eat meat. That's a fallacy. I hear the strangest things. This guy's got canine teeth too, much bigger than yours. He's a vegetarian. 
Matter of fact, <laughs> some of the biggest animals in the world, not that they would be your role models, elephants, hippos, they're vegetarians. And so, and they got some big tusks. The other thing is you can look at the digestive um, system of an animal and a cow, vegetarian animal, it's got a di digestive system that processes things much more slowly. And then you've got the digestive system of like a dog or a cat, and they don't have the perforations in the intestines that humans have and other vegetarian animals. We are designed to be vegetarians. And uh, you'll thrive a lot better if you follow God's manual. Now, something else you'll notice biblically. You look in the Bible, you'll realize up until the time of the flood, when there's a lot, of, a lot more vegetation, a lot was destroyed during the flood, and meat-eating became a lot more common and um, uh, more uh, frequent following the flood. You look at each one of those lines, it's like 100 years. Noah lived 950 years. Methuselah, 969. Seth, 912 years. After the flood, look at how their lifespans began to go down, where they went down to like Abraham, 175. Isaac, 180. He lived longer than his father because his father had too many wives. Isaac only had one. Then you go back down and you see Jacob, I think he was like 147. Joseph, 110. You get to King David, 70. And now David says, our lives are three score and ten. And if by reason of strength they are four score, there's still aches and pains. That's a loose translation. And so uh, our lives have drastically changed. And part of that, I think, is connected with how the diet of man changed. Oh, by the way, as some of you remember reading, you've a lot of schools used to have young people read a book called Lost Horizon by James Hilton talking about these people that found this miraculous valley of Shangri-La in the Himalayas where people lived hundreds of years. And he actually wrote that book based upon a certain amount of truth. There are people that live up in the Hunza Mountain of the Himalayas that uh, they're apricot farmers, they eat very little meat, and they live, it's very common to find people over 100 in the valley. And so this has been demonstrated around the world that there is the cause and effect of the diet. Oh, I'll forget if I don't say this now. National Geographic did something. I, I don't have it in the presentation, but you can look it up. Look up Blue Zones. They had a National Geographic magazine. They said, we've done research for years. We've determined that there are certain groups of people that live longer on average than others. And they identified three areas of the world that they had unusually long livers. And I don't mean livers like that kind of liver. I mean long lifespans. And they said that would be the people that live in Sardinia, in the Mediterranean. They lived very common to find them 100 years of age. The people live in Okinawa, Japan. And the third group was Seventh-day Adventists where that had a large enclave there in Loma Linda. But they noticed it was true of Adventists wherever they were. Part of that is because they practice the Bible principles of health. It's a fact, friends. It's science. You can look that up for yourself. So we've talked about the mammals. What about the fish? What types of fish and seafood are clean? These you shall eat of all that are in the waters. Whatever has fins and scales, them you can eat. Those are two criteria, like the hooves and chewing the cud needed both criteria, fins and scales. Sharks got fins. It doesn't have scales. They're scavengers. You're not supposed to eat them. And what I think is really interesting is the Navy, uh, they financed research to develop a manual for sailors to study in the event they were shot down. And this would be for pilots, it's for military people. If they were shot down and they were in a life raft, until they're rescued, they wanted to know what rule of thumb can they use to know what sea life they can catch and eat. Because in the life rafts, they actually had fishing gear. And they had all these different, these animals got more toxins and this one doesn't. And, you know, they had a, it was a manual. You know how the government does everything. It's like this big. And the, the military leaders said to the uh, authors, they said, look, you expect the soldiers to remember all of this. We need a simple rule to help them know what they can and can't eat. You know what they came up with after millions of your tax dollars? They said, well, if it's got fins and scales, it's probably safe. That's what the Bible says, word for word. They did all the research and said, wow, how did God know all that? But all that's in the seas and the rivers that does not have fins and scales, the Bible says, and all that moves in the water or any living thing which is in the water, they are an abomination to you. I used to love to eat lobster, shrimp cocktail. I used to scuba dive in Florida where we'd go and we'd spear lobster and boil them ourselves. And uh, I'll tell you, if you eat lobster tail, 
with butter, you may as well go ask the doctor to give you a cholesterol IV drip because that is about as thick as the cholesterol can get. <laughs> it's not good for you. Plus, these animals are scavengers. The way you catch crabs and lobster is you put something decomposing in a cage, drop it to the bottom. They are what you call bottom feeders, and they crawl in and they clean up what falls down. You can get a lot of diseases from shellfish. Which birds are unclean? Does God give us a rule or some guidelines for the animals? Yes. It says in Leviticus 11, verse 15 and 16, every raven after his kind, this is in the COVID family, they're very, very smart birds, and the owl and the night hawk and the cacaw and the hawk after its kind, so they are unclean to you. You're not supposed to eat them. These are the raptors, the birds of carrion. The only birds that were clean was what they identified as the foraging birds. And it doesn't use that word in the Bible, but it says, you know, the quail, and <laughs> technically pigeons are unclean, so they'll never starve in New York City or in, in Rome. And um, so the, the uh, foraging birds, chicken, turkey, uh, you know, grouse, these are all your foraging birds. They peck around and eat the seeds. And yeah, they do eat some worms and bugs in the forest. They were in the clean category. The other birds were unclean. But you're better off if you don't eat any meat. Are the laws about clean and unclean animals part of Moses', Moses ceremonial law, which ended at the cross? I hear this all the time. People say, oh yeah, well that's part of the old Mosaic law. That was for the Jews. That's not what the Bible says. Go back in Genesis chapter 7, and you got Noah is being instructed by God as he's loading the animals on the ark. He said, come you and your house into the ark of every clean beast you shall take to you them by sevens. And the beasts that are not clean, you'll take by two. And you know, God never stops and explains to Noah what is a clean and an unclean beast because he assumes he knows that. Now, a test for our audience. How many here are related to Noah? That'd be all of us. Is that just Jews? No. So if God made a distinction be between clean and unclean for Noah, it's still the same today. We're all related. Be not deceived. Galatians 6, 7, God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, he will also reap. If we are sowing bad food, wrong quantities in our system, we're going to reap the consequences of that. You know, uh, Karen and I had a friend that uh, she was actually a member of our church. And she has since pa passed away, but she, I remember 111 years old. We go visit her. And uh, I actually was her pastor, and she lived in the same house with her her sisters and her sister's husband and, and uh, just a real saint and vegetarian all of her life. Uh, and I remember asking her brother-in-law, Art was his name, I said, how is it that you're so old and so healthy? And we were at the dinner table. He said, there's three rules to long life. He said, wake up when you're still a little tired. Stop eating when you're still a little hungry. Stop talking when you still have something left to say. And he said, you do that you'll have a long and a prosperous life. Does God say that eating unclean food is a serious offense? Uh, yes, friends. Isaiah 66, verse 15 and 17. For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury. They that sanctify themselves and purify themselves, eating swine's flesh and the abomination and the mouse, notice it puts mice and pigs in the same category, shall be consumed together, says the Lord. God says your body's a temple of the Holy Spirit. The most outrageous thing that a pagan could do would be to bring a pig into God's temple. And uh, someone used to use the, uh, the saying, you don't want to be bringing the pork chops to the bar mitzvah. And uh, it, that was not good. <laughs> Someone's going to quote. Matter of fact, we'll try and answer this one in our question time. Doesn't the Bible say that every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused if it's received with thanksgiving? Do you think that verse means you can eat anything out there that crawls? That God intends for you to eat bats and, and buzzards and cockroach sandwiches? And Of course not. Those, that's absurd to even think that you should eat skunk. So the idea that you should eat everything and use this verse that way is not what this verse is saying. I've never met a parent yet. We've got a couple of kids that are here in the audience that uh, if you are getting ready for school and you're fixing your own breakfast and you sit down and you get a bowl and you start putting 
a little bit of sugar frosted flakes and you put ice cream on top and then you get some chocolate syrup and you put it on there and your parents say, whoa, hey, what's happening here? And he said, don't worry, mom and dad. And then you start putting two or three spoons of sugar on top of that. So no, you can't do that. You say, oh, don't worry. I'm going to pray over it. As long as I pray over it, it'll be blessed. That no parent would accept that. And yet there are Christians who think that God is going to turn his head and act like there's no consequences for the choices you're making and what you eat and what you drink. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. What you sow, you will reap. It's a fact of life. What about the vision of Peter in Acts chapter 10? Well, in that vision, Peter explains it has nothing to do with food. He tells the church leaders, God has shown me not to call any man unclean. It's not pig, P-I-G, it was M-A-N. It says, I'm not to call any man unclean. It had nothing to do with food. Peter never takes anything from the vision and eats it. There it is, Acts 10, verse 28. God has shown me I should not call a man common or unclean. It had absolutely nothing to do with food. That was just a vision to illustrate something. Now, you might say, Pastor Doug, it can't really matter that much to God what we eat. We can eat anything we want if we've got faith. Really, how did sin enter the world? Wasn't it through somebody eating something they weren't supposed to eat? So yes, it does matter. What is a good basic health rule for Christians? Every man that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now, there's three rules when it comes to eating and drinking. You've got, you know, red light, like traffic. Green light, yellow light. Red light means what? Just checking. Stop, okay? Green light, go freely. Yellow light, caution. Alcohol, what would that be? Red light. Um, If you were to have uh, some dessert, a cookie or two, yellow light, <laughs> too much of a good thing. Bible says honey's good, don't eat too much. <laughs> and then green light, fruits, grains, nuts, vegetables. And so it's doing the right things in moderation. Are the Bible health principles still practical today? I'm going to go through a list of, with you from like A to L and just show you how practical these principles are and note the scriptures that I'm giving at the same time. Quarantine procedures control contagious disease. Do we know about that in the world today? I prepared this slide months ago <laughs> before any of this happened. You know, Moses, the way they stopped the bubonic plague is they read the writings of Moses about quarantine for disease. Human body waste should be buried. Do you know God gave that rule? For simple sanitation. I've been in many countries in the world. They still don't practice that. Washing the body and clothing controls germs. Also in the Bible, it talks about regular washing and washing your articles to keep them clean. Moral living presents sexual diseases. And here's your verses, Leviticus 18, Proverbs 5, Colossians 3, 5, and 6. And I didn't want to rush past that, the importance of moral living, without addressing there's an epidemic in our society of people being exposed to immoral things on the Internet, and that is affecting their health, their mental health and their physical health. And God wants you to have the victory over that. Bible says, blessed are the pure in heart. They will see God. Animal fat should not be eaten. It's in the Bible. And uh, if fat, you know, disease can be transferred from animal to animal through the blood, through the fat, through the tissue. And why would you want to take that in? And now they're finding that humans are becoming resistant to antibiotics because they're eating meat where the, the ranchers are injecting the livestock with so many antibiotics to prevent their diseases that people are developing resistance to it and regular antibiotics are, are not working as well. And the other thing about fat is I think everybody knows what happens. So many health problems, cancer, heart disease, restriction of your blood vessels comes from eating these uh, products that are full of uh, fat. Hatred and bitterness. It's not just what you eat. It's what's eating you that affects your health. Hatred and bitterness is detrimental to one's health. Health. The Bible says we need to learn to forgive, to be positive. Overeating is harmful. Proverbs 23. If you're a man given to appetite, put a knife to your throat, <laughs> the Bible says. God wants us to, con you know, the purpose for eating and drinking. It says in uh, Proverbs that, um, or maybe it's Ecclesiastes. The blessed are you, O land, when your 
princes eat for strength and not for drunkenness, not for gluttony, eating at the appropriate time. Our bodies need proper rest. Not only is it important to have a good night's sleep, they found that has a lot to do with your health, but also God wants us to have a day of rest. We've talked about the importance of the Sabbath and the health benefits connected with that. The importance of work. Not only does it say you're to rest every Sabbath, it says six days you should labor and do all of your work. God wants us to be active. He gave us bodies. Adam and Eve were supposed to dress and keep the garden, and they were busy with work. And even after sin, God said, you're going to do it in the sweat of your brow, but that was for man's good. And so we need to be active. Your bodies stay healthy if you use them. If you don't use it, you lose it. A positive attitude is good medicine. You know, don't spend all your time worrying. Be cheerful. Know that God loves you and live by faith. The Bible tells us that a Christian should be a joyful person, a happy person. A parent's habits will often be picked up by the children. You know, it says in the Bible that sometimes children struggle to the third and fourth generation because of the example of the parents. So what you do will often be reproduced in your children, including your health practices. Will people in heaven kill and eat animals? Oh, the Bible says, they will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. The animals will, not only will we not kill and eat animals, they will not be killing each other. There's no more death there. This idea of death and, and dying. You know, I've heard one of the single most important things that people could do to uh, help preserve the environment and to have enough food for people. If people around the world went to a vegetarian diet, you know how much food it takes to keep all the cattle and the pigs alive and how much water it takes, and then uh, for people to get the, the meat. It would be so much better if you put it into the ground and turned it into vegetation. The Bible tells us there'll be no more death. No, we're not going to be eating animals and killing them. How can I make diet and health changes that will please the Lord? I know, friends, I've talked about a lot of difficult things. Some of you are going, wow, this is pretty heavy, Pastor Doug. How could we do all these things? Without the Lord, you can't do anything. Now, I'm telling you from a person uh, with firsthand experience. As I learned these things growing up, I drank, I smoked cigarettes, I took drugs, I ate everything that was abominable, and I suffered the consequences. By God's grace, little by little, he helped me to make those changes. And uh, I feel so much better now because I am living by those principles. And I've got a lot of friends I grew up with that didn't learn these things and I look at them now, I think they're old. I realize they're my age. But it's because of their lifestyles that they're struggling. How can I make these changes? The Bible says in Ezekiel 11, verse 18 to 20, they will take away all of the detestable things thereof. Got to make some changes and just take some things out of our lives. God might want you to go home and not only have a converted heart, but convert your refrigerator and your, your lifestyle. He says, I will give them one heart I'll put a new spirit within them and they will walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances and do them. God wants you to be well. He wants to bless you. You know, we studied in that prophetic book of Daniel at the beginning of the lesson how Daniel made those changes and God honored him. He was not only 10 times wiser, but he lived a lot longer. He outlived several kings. God will bless you with a longer, stronger, brighter life if we will follow Bible principles practical things on good health. And I didn't even cover it all, so I hope I get some more questions on this. But I want to close, and I want to close by praying that God will help you to make whatever changes you can make. We're appealing to your mind. Your health will affect your mind. Your mind will understand and appreciate spiritual truth, and you'll be blessed from that. Father in heaven, please be with each person that is watching right now. And for those who may have been convicted that they've not been caring for their bodies, comfort them. Help them know that you showed them these things because you love them. You want them to make the changes so that they can feel better and to better serve you and their fellow man. And so please bless, Lord. Grant them the strength. Lord, we all want to present our bodies as a living sacrifice and that you would fill our temples with your spirit. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. All right, don't go far, friends. Be back in about two minutes answering your Bible questions. Amazing Facts offers some of the best Christian resources for all ages. We hope our products will enrich your life and your walk with the Lord.
Want more energy and better health? Get inspired with amazing health facts. You'll learn simple principles of abundant living for a healthier body, mind, and spirit. Get yours today by calling 800-538-7275 or visit afbookstore.com. I really wanted to start a new devotional habit, but life got in the way. Next thing I know, we're a month into the new year, and I'm like, what's the point of starting? Then I saw 365 amazing answers to big Bible questions. Each day is a single study, so you can start anywhere on any day and not miss a thing. They're crisp, clear, and enlightening. Get yours today by calling 800-538-7275 or visit afbookstore.com. Would you like to know God's plan for our broken world as revealed in Bible prophecy? Want practical, trusted solutions for your biggest challenges? Freshly updated and redesigned, Amazing Facts Bible Study Guides provide 27 Bible-based topical lessons with beautiful graphics and straightforward answers that are enlightening, encouraging, and easy to understand. Each study guide leads you step-by-step -step to real, relevant Bible answers for the most important questions in your life. How can I have better health and relationships? When and how will Jesus come again? And so much more. Don't leave the future to chance. Transform your life with truths from the Amazing Facts Bible Study Guides. Order your complete set today by visiting afbookstore.com or by calling 800-538-7275. Hello, friends. We'd like to welcome you back to our amazing, uh, I almost said amazing adventure, but this <laughs> is amazing Revelation Now program. We did a kids program called Amazing Adventure. But we are grateful for your Bible questions, and uh, we thank you for the great questions that are coming. Pastor Doug, it's always an interesting subject when you talk mm -hmm. about that, and a lot of questions, practical questions that people have, so uh, we'll try and get to as many of them as we can. So we'll put up our first question for tonight. It says, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 4 says, Every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused. Can you explain this verse? Yes, I think so. We'll do our best. If you look in 1 Corinthians 4, let me read this to you in context. Now the Spirit speaks, this is verse 1, 1 Timothy 4, 1. The Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot lion. Hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats or foods which God has created to be received with thanksgiving of them that believe and know the truth. Now he says that this group, well for one thing, it says that they'll uh, be speaking against marriage. There is a church that says that they're priests and popes should not marry. They say that there's things you should or shouldn't eat on Friday. It has nothing to do with saying that you shouldn't eat unclean food because it says they're commanding to, uh, to abstain from meats which God created to be received. Now that means there's some meats which are not created to be received. This is not disclaiming that. And then he says every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused if it's received with thanksgiving for it is sanctified by the word of God. Mm -hmm. He said these creatures which are sanctified by the word of God you're okay with. And we told you what those are. And so... Uh, uh, there's no problem if you're eating the animals that God has described as being clean. If you're eating those things that are unclean, they are not sanctified by the Word of God. Okay, very good. The next question that we have, it says, Romans chapter 14, verse 3, 14 and then 20 says, Let him who eats despise not him who does not eat. There is nothing unclean of itself. All things indeed are pure. Can you explain this? Yeah, this verse, as well as uh, the verse that we just looked at, understand what's going on in Bible times. Um, the Jewish Christians had a problem with the Gentile Christians eating food that had been butchered in the Roman and the Greek marketplaces because before they butchered an animal in the world back then, the, they had all these pagan gods. They always felt like if something's going to die, let's offer it and get some credit for offering it. And so they always had idols there They'd have an idol of Jupiter, one of the different gods, and uh, they'd butcher the animals and they'd say a little prayer. Well, when the, when the Jews went to the marketplace, they thought, well, we can't eat that because it's been offered to a pagan god. We'll be participating in worshiping a pagan god. 
Paul said, look, you know, if your faith is weak, just eat vegetables and don't eat it. But he's talking about eating clean animals that, you know, a goat or a chicken or a cow or whatever they had butchered had nothing to do with uh, authorizing them eating anything. He's saying just because it's been butchered in a pagan marketplace, matter of fact, Paul says, I think it's in 1 Corinthians, eat what's sold in the shambles, asking no questions for conscience sake. Mm -hmm. Don't say, did you offer this to a God? Just eat it, pray over it, you'll be okay. The argument back then was whether or not you could eat things that you bought in the public markets that may have been offered to a God. And he says, don't judge your brother if he does this, if your faith is weak. Let me give you a modern example of how that works. I like Asian food. Often I'll go to an Asian restaurant and somewhere in there they'll have a Buddha or a pagoda and they're burning incense to Buddha. Well, I'm not a Buddhist. Uh, they may be Buddhists. Uh, just because they got a statue of Buddha in the restaurant doesn't bother me. I enjoy the food just the fine. I don't feel like I've sacrificed my faith. If I go with a friend who says, oh, we can't eat here, there's a Buddha, I'll say, okay, we'll go somewhere else. Yeah, you know, their faith is weak and they may not want to do that because they feel like I'm honoring or I'm supporting Buddhism. You know, Paul said, uh, if your faith's weak, if you can't do that of faith, then don't do it. That's what he's talking about. Okay, very good. And I think we have one more uh, question on the screen. Isn't it enough just to love the Lord and not concern ourselves with God's laws of health? Well, the way we show our love for God is by taking care of his property. And that's your body. And so if you love God then why would you want to do something to hurt yourself? You love your children. If you're a parent, you care how your children live. You care about their health. And because you love them, you care. Because God loves you, he cares. And if you love him, you'll care and follow. This is not only Bible things. We talk about scientific facts tonight. Mm -hmm. The things that we shared, the unclean animals, scientifically, are more toxic. The uh, eating blood and eating fat and those things the Bible forbids, and that's in the New Testament as well. It, it can transfer disease. Uh, the importance of exercise and, and clean water and sunshine and all these things are just practical tips of health. Okay. Ready to go through some of the questions that's coming. Okay. We have another Bible question or at least another Bible verse. Can you explain Colossians 2.16 that says, Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food or drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or Sabbath. Colossians 2.16. Yeah. Well, we'll start out by reading verse 14. It says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. You've got to start there. So he's talking about the ordinances that were against them. You look in Deuteronomy and Exodus, it says that the ceremonial laws of Moses were written on paper. And the Bible says that they were put in the outside of the ark to witness against the people. It's not the Ten Commandments. So he said, let no man judge you therefore in meat or in drink or, or in respect of a holiday or a new moon or of Sabbath days. Notice Sabbath days. He's not talking about the weekly Sabbath. He's talking about the annual Sabbath days. They came yearly. They came after sin. And he said, let no one judge you in meat and drink. He's talking about the meat and drink offerings that the Jews had. So the Jewish Christians were trying to get the new Gentile believers to practice some of the ceremonial laws. Paul says, those things are all nailed to the cross. Ten Commandments are not nailed to the cross, and the health laws are not nailed to the cross. There's a lot of laws in the Bible that are just common sense. Your neighbor's donkey wanders away, bring it back. That's a civil law, but it's still good principle today. And the health laws. The stomach of a Jew and the digestive system of a Jew is not different from the digestive system of everybody else. You will benefit. And by the way, that, um, I think that the Jewish nation has demonstrated through history that they do have pretty good life expectancies. If you go study the Orthodox Jews, they live longer than the average. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, right, very good. You. Thank you. Let's look at the next question. Uh, this is an interesting question. Um, Exodus chapter 20, the second commandment says, For I, the Lord, am your God, a jealous God, visiting the iniquity upon the fathers and upon the children to the third and fourth generation. The question is, where are we in this third and fourth generations? And can we explain what that means? Yeah, that's, that's very good. Now, first of all, keep in mind the Bible's very clear that God does not punish a child for the sins of the parents, and God does not punish a parent for the sins of the child. I think that's in Ezekiel 18, that the righteousness of the righteous will be on him and the wickedness of the wicked will be on them. But then he says, punishing unto the third and fourth generation of those that uh, hate me. That's not because God is arbitrarily punishing descendants. It's because the parents pass on a behavior. 
I've sometimes talked to people that are struggling with bad health and they say, well, I just got this from my parents. I said, well, did you inherit bad health or did you inherit behaviors and diet practices from your parents that are giving you bad health? And so sometimes because the behaviors of the children are reproduced by, uh, by of the parents is reproduced by the children, it can go two or three generations. Okay, very good. Here's something. Uh, is duck considered unclean? And then part two, are there any insects that are considered clean? Yes, I think the person asking must know uh, about the insects. The Bible <laughs> says that John the Baptist ate locusts and wild honey. And whether he ate the grasshoppers or not, uh, we're not sure. There's also something called a locust bean. It could be the same word, which is like a carob pod. But uh, technically, grasshoppers are seasonal. So I, I hope that it's just hard for me to picture John the Baptist with little grasshopper <laughs> legs in his teeth. But in any event, it, it, technically they are clean. There are certain insects that uh, grasshoppers they could eat. And, of course, they're largely vegetarian. Um, and I think they eat them in Africa, don't they? Some places, yeah. Yeah. But um, on the first part of that question, um, what was the first part of that question? Duck. Duck, Is oh, duck yeah. Clean? No, ducks are uncl unclean. Uh, ducks are not in the foraging bird category. They're in the same category as swan. I think the swan is mentioned specifically in the uh, Levitical laws. Okay, another one that we have here is what about Matthew 15, 11, where uh, Jesus seems to indicate that foods are, all foods are clean. So Matthew 15, 11. Okay. That which goes into the mouth defiles, uh, so not that which goes into the mouth defiles a man, but that which comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. Now, by the way, if you read this in the NIV version, they put in a parenthetical statement that isn't even in the original. They said, in saying this, Jesus declared all things clean. At least that's in the Mark gospel version of that. Jesus here is not talking about eating any specific food. They're arguing about whether or not you can eat with hands that have been ceremonially washed. And so, uh, yeah, there's, uh, I used to use this argument with God. I was smoking cigarettes. I came to the Lord. I was convicted. He wanted me to quit. But I said, well, Lord, it says right here, it's not what goes in your mouth that defiles you, so I can keep smoking. And God spoke to me and he said, yeah, but if what goes in your mouth affects what comes out of your mouth, uh, then he, he, it is the filing. And uh, so, yeah, Jesus isn't saying that through this they could eat anything. Notice, Christ said this here in the Gospel of Matthew. Three and a half years later, Peter has a vision. He says, Lord, I have never eaten anything common or unclean. If Jesus had been telling the apostles, you can eat anything, then why was Peter still not eating anything unclean in Acts chapter 10? So this is not what Jesus is teaching, that you could eat anything. Right, and I think the controversy in that time was eating food with unwashed hands, ceremonial yeah. washing of the hands. Yeah, no, food is, no specific food is mentioned. Okay, here's another question. What do you think about this pandemic that we are going through, and do you think this might be a warning for us? You know, Jesus does say in Matthew 24 that one of the many signs of the last days, he said there will be plagues, pestilence is the word that Jesus uses, and this is a pestilence. It is certainly not the deadliest that we've had. Um, I think the, the government is having a hard time getting people to kind of uh, curtail certain activities because people realize that it is serious, but it's not the bubonic plague and it's not the Spanish flu kind of serious. And so... Uh, it's kind of in the middle somewhere that if, if people are high risk and they get it, it can be very serious. Um, you know, and I think it is a sign. What, what it does, first of all, I think it, it shows you how quickly people are ready to surrender their freedoms because of government mandates. That helps us to visualize how quickly and easily this can happen in the future with religious laws. Uh, in the interest of the public good, you can sell almost anything. Um, and the other thing is that um, there could be be a, a much more deadly pandemic that could sweep the planet. If we got something like the Spanish flu, look at how much havoc it could wreak before uh, a, v a vaccine is found. Mm -hmm. Or if you get uh, another bubonic plague or outbreaks of Ebola or cholera and all kinds of things can cause problems. Okay. But you know what? Follow the health principles we're talking about tonight and your odds will greatly improve. Absolutely. Okay, here's another question. Is drinking a glass of red wine occasionally wrong? Well, I, I, I would always wonder why my father told me to stop smoking pot when he drank martinis every night. 
And if your kid comes home with a little cocaine, fact is more people die from alcohol than cocaine. Or a little heroin, more people die from alcohol than heroin. So if you think, well, I'm only going to use it once a month, would you want your kid doing something that could be deadly and addictive? So, yeah, I know people just say, oh, but it's so pleasant just to get that relaxation. I used to drink wine, friends. I know how it feels. I understand. But I realize, you know, I, I don't want to do anything out of love for my neighbor. I don't want to do anything that's going to make my neighbor stumble. Uh, let me tell you a quick story. I'm looking at the clock, and I, I might have time. I used to pastor a church on the Indian Reservation. Many people know that um, American Indians seem to have a greater disposition towards alcoholism. It's very serious. And it just has uh, destroyed uh, a lot of the culture. Um, if my members thought that Pastor Doug was drinking one glass of wine a week, they can point to me and say, he drinks. I might be able to control it. They can't. By my example, I can ruin their lives. And so don't do anything that is going to make your brother stumble. You don't have to. So why, why, why would you want to play with something deadly? It's like Russian roulette. Okay. Another question that we have. Um, the Bible says Jesus turned water into wine. Why do you say that Jesus turned water into grape juice? Yeah, well, the word there in Greek, I think it's oinos, mm -hmm. is the exact same word for grape juice. The, the word grape juice did not exist. The Bible clearly talks, is it Isaiah 65, where he said, uh, as the new wine is in the cluster, don't destroy it for there's a mm -hmm. blessing in it. The Bible tells us even in the cluster, when they squeeze the clusters, they call it wine. It, grape juice and wine, the words are used interchangeably. And when they first had a grape harvest and they turned it into grape juice, they'd put it into wineskins. Jesus said, you do not put new wine, that's grape juice, into old wineskins because the fermentation in the wineskins will quickly ferment the new grape juice and the skins expand when they ferment and they blow up, they burst. Christ makes it really clear in that statement that there was a distinction between grape juice and the fermented wine. Fresh wine, fermented wine. At the wedding, he made new wine. He made the best. Okay. Here's an interesting question. What about Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 15? Can you explain this? I'll, uh, I'll read a passage. Okay. I've got it right here. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 15. However, you may slaughter and eat meat within your gates, whatever your heart desires, according to the blessings of the Lord your God, which is given you. The unclean and the clean may eat of it, of the gazelle and the deer alike. Yeah, there were people who were struggling with uh, some uncleanness. The Bible says not only were there unclean animals, there's something you could do mm -hmm. that could make you unclean. And that could be everything from attending a funeral, you would be unclean, or you might have some outbreak in your skin and the priest said that you're unclean. But during the feast, they said the clean and the unclean may eat of it. He wasn't saying you may eat unclean animals. Mm -hmm. He's saying whether you're a person who's struggling with some ceremonial uncleanness, we just talked about washing your hands. Um, when David came to um, get some articles from the temple and the priest gave them holy bread, the priest asked David, he said, are you clean? Are you and your young men clean? Is what he was asking them. And they said, we are. And so Paul, uh, Moses is saying, when you're going to a feast that you can slaughter and eat clean animals, a clean or unclean person could participate. Okay, this person's wondering, if the ceremonial law came to an end at the cross, wouldn't that also include the unclean meats or clean and unclean meats? You know, that's a good question. The difference is the ceremonial law, you see that growing up out of the sanctuary and its services during the Exodus with Moses. That's when you get Leviticus and those books. The difference between clean and unclean and the health laws goes back to Genesis. It was for all mankind. And so, and you just think about the practicality of those health laws. The ceremonial law and the health law are different things. Ceremonial laws are things like circumcision, sacrificing of lambs, so forth, the offerings in the temple. The health laws were just practical health laws that are still true today. And you know what else is interesting? The unclean and clean animal separation between the two, that had to be applied right at the very beginning because you couldn't offer an unclean animal as a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. It had to be a clean animal. So those, even way back in the time of Genesis, the beginning, they needed to know what was clean and unclean. Yeah, Cain and Abel, when Abel brought his offering, he had to know what it was to be a clean. clean. It says he bought from the first lean of his flock a mm. lamb. It was clean. Okay. All right, another question. What is the latter rain, and how will I know if I receive it? Good question. 
Uh, the latter rain is a term you find in the Bible that is a spiritual term for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the last days. It's also a farming term. In the Hebrew economy, they did not have artificial irrigation, and so they used to pray for what they called the spring rains or the former rains, which was what would ripen the grain. Then they had the latter rain that would come and, uh, well, I'm sorry, the spring rain would sprout the seed. The latter rain would come and ripen it before the harvest. And Pentecost has been compared to the former rain where God poured out the Spirit, the gospel seed of Jesus grew into a great church. Now before the harvest, he comes in Revelation pictured to harvest the earth. We're praying for the latter rain, an outpouring of the Spirit, Pentecostal power again in, uh, to prepare the world for the second coming. The gospel will grow in great power. Okay, another question that we have. Why does the Bible say that Daniel and his friends looked fatter in flesh than the other boys who ate the unhealthy food. Yeah, a lot of people are saying, well, I don't know that I want to eat Daniel's diet because I don't want to be fatter in flesh. Keep in mind, they had just gone through a, um, a besiegement in Jerusalem. Daniel and his friends had been carried captive. They'd made a long journey. They were probably gaunt and thin. And they were putting, wanting to put a healthy amount of meat back on their bones. And Daniel and his friends, by eating the best diet that God afforded them, started to look... Uh, when it says fatter in flesh, it means they started to fill out. They probably looked a little bit like POWs when they arrived in Babylon. Mm -hmm. And they started showing more signs of health and ruddiness, elasticity in their step. Okay. All right, here's a question, Pastor Doug. Um, 1 Samuel 4 says Saul took a sword and fell on it. 2 Samuel says an Amalekite killed him, which is correct. Well, we later learned that uh, the Amalekite wanted to get a reward from David, so he lied and said, I killed your enemy, the king. He actually came on the battle and saw where Saul had fallen on his sword, and uh, he wanted to get credit. He thought since Saul had been trying to kill David, David would be happy. Mm -hmm. And he brought the crown and the bracelet of Saul, and he gave it to David and said, I, yeah, he was badly wounded, and so I, I, he asked me to kill him, and I killed him. He could see from the battle scene that Saul had fallen on his own sword. He wanted to get the credit. He misunderstood David altogether. Now, that was David's father-in-law. And he said, I just killed the Lord's anointed and your father-in-law. And David killed the Amalekite, and he lied. Hmm. He was trying to get a reward. Okay, very good. Again, we want to thank you for all of the great questions that you've sent in. We want to remind you about our free offer. It's the Amazing Health Magazine, and this is just one of our premier gifts. And it's available for free. You can download it by just texting the word HEALTHFUL to the number 40544. Or just go to the Revelation Now website and you'll be able to download a digital copy of our magazine, Amazing Health Facts. Now, Pastor Doug, we don't have a program tomorrow evening, which is Thursday evening, Pacific Time, but we are going to be wrapping things up this coming weekend, Friday evening, a very important presentation, and Saturday morning. Yes, we've got uh, two very important presentations that are left. We've saved some of the best for last. It's going to talk to you about, in light of what's happening in Bible prophecy, how you can be ready for Jesus' soon return. Don't miss Friday night and Saturday morning, 11 o'clock. All right, look forward to seeing you then.